Today we're going to talk about Antarctica. Antarctica is in the southernmost portion of the world, and for those of you who are directionally challenged, Antarctica covers the South Pole, and not the North. So no, Santa Claus has no claim to Antarctica. Plus, he prefers to make his residence in the North Pole, and not the South Pole. Anyways, Antarctica is a continent, just like the continent you are sitting on as you watch this broadcast. There is plenty of land and water in Antarctica, though it tends to be covered up by lots and lots of ice. What makes Antarctica different from most other continents is that it doesn't have any indigenous people to the land. Yes, people live in Antarctica right now, but they tend to be affiliated with gigantic research stations located on the continent and are not considered indigenous, year-round inhabitants of the land. So that brings us to our next question. Just who owns Antarctica anyways? And why do they own it? And how did all this come to be? Well, first let's break down which countries claim which parts of this frozen continent. So starting from the far left of the map, we have Chile, followed by Argentina, Great Britain, then our beloved Norway, followed by Australia, France with a tiny piece of the pie, followed again by Australia, and finally New Zealand. Then there is a fairly big slice of the pie that remains unclaimed to this day, and is the largest unclaimed landmass in the whole world. These land claims have been made for historical and geographic reasons, which we will get into. Yet almost none of these claims are recognised by any other countries, besides the ones who are currently claiming a piece of this beautifully frozen continent. But without further delay, let's try and understand each country's reasoning as to why they think they own a piece of Antarctica. Chile and Argentina Both these countries state that their claims to territory in the Antarctic go back to the 1400s. But if you know a thing or two about history, you would say, but what? How is that possible? The Antarctic wasn't even discovered until a couple of hundred years later. And you would be correct. Antarctica was a long way from being discovered back in the 1400s. Well, let's work this out then. You see, both Chile and Argentina were colonised as a result of Spain and Portugal's competition to colonise the Americas. Well, Spain and Argentina were both part of the Spanish Empire, and Spain, back then, made a deal with Portugal to draw an imaginary line running from the northern part of the world all the way down to the southern tip. And that line of demarcation included lands that had yet to be discovered. When Chile and Argentina got their independence from the Spanish Empire, they both claimed that they had inherited this line of demarcation from their colonial masters. Even land that was unclaimed. On top of that, like other countries, both Chile and Argentina share some history with coastal parts of Antarctica, as they were heavily involved in whaling and sealing operations. To make matters more complicated is that Chile has a rather unique claim in that it argues that portions of underwater land may have been, at one point in time, geographically part of the Andes mountain range, which extends the length of Chile and acts as a physical border between Argentina and Chile. France well, this is perhaps the most boring of all claims, so let's discuss France's claims. According to the historical record, a French explorer discovered a small part of Antarctica's coast and decided to name it after his wife, and thus we have Adeliland, as it's called. So essentially, some French dude discovers some tiny portion of Antarctica, named it after his wife, and went home. Enough said. Moving on, England. England was the earliest claimant of territory in the Antarctic back in 1908. The English had been running several expeditions at that time, including the unsuccessful Scott mission, and has a history of whaling and sealing in the islands just offshore of the icy continent. Perhaps that is why they claimed a portion of Antarctica that includes these islands. Australia and New Zealand. Britain originally claimed the claims of these two countries, but in the course of decolonisation, the claim to these lands was transferred over to Australia and New Zealand in the 1920s and 30s. So here we go with the final piece of the pie, that is to say, the last country on our list to lay claim to Antarctica. 
First of all, like the English, Norway had a tradition of whaling and sealing off the coast of the frozen continent. What makes Norway's claim particularly interesting is that Norwegian explorers, early in the century, had squared off with the British in an effort to reach the South Pole first. The head of Norway's expedition to the South Pole was an explorer named Roald Amundsen. Amundsen made his departure for the South Pole a few weeks before the ill-fated British expedition of Robert Falcon Scott. What was the difference between both expeditions? They both made the 900-mile journey to the South Pole from different starting points, but both points were of approximately equal distance. Amundsen made it to the South Pole first, five weeks before the Scott expedition, and utilised dogs, skis and other winter methods and equipment to transport him and his crew. On the other hand, Scott used ponies and a relentless amount of human pushing and pulling to make his way to the pole. Once he arrived, again five weeks after Amundsen, he snapped a quick picture of him and some of his crew by a tent. At first glance, the image appears to be one of the British planting their flag, but when you look closely, you see a Norwegian flag flying high over a previously erected tent. Later historical documentation would reveal that Scott was taking a picture with his crew at the South Pole and in front of the Norwegian flag as an acknowledgement that Amundsen, and not him, was the first person to reach the pole. Unfortunately for Scott and his crew, they succumbed to frigid temperatures and weather just 11 miles away from a resupply outpost that would have saved their lives. Following World War II, the US became more interested in what was happening in the Antarctic as did the Soviet Union, and others. People and countries were weary of war and conflict, and the Antarctic Treaty was designed to promote peace in the Antarctic, and furthermore, scientific exploration. Treaty negotiations began in the late 1950s, and the treaty came into force in 1961. Interestingly enough, none of the signatories to the treaty, as of now there are 53 countries, are forced to recognise the original claims of countries like Great Britain and Norway, but the US and Russia do reserve the right to make territorial claims in the future. So what does this all mean, and why is it important? Well, with each passing day, the slow-moving freight train of climate change is approaching, and as land masses melt and sea levels rise, it is worth pointing out that 80% of the world's fresh water lies in Antarctica.